Okay. Thank you very much for the introduction and uh, thank you for the invitation. I'm very sorry I couldn't reach you in uh, person and I'm also very sorry to be the last talk before uh, uh, between you and the coffee break. So <laughs> I will try to uh, uh, keep it as short as possible. So as the title suggests, I would like to talk about uh, uh, emergent properties uh, of deep neural networks, uh, especially uh, regarding uh, uh, information and the role of noise uh, during training. What do I mean by this? Well, so let's say that we have a trained neural network. What we know that this network uh, managed to do is that it can extract from very high dimensional data a very precise amount of information that we care about. Uh, for example, uh, whether the object in the picture is bird, it's a cat or a car. And uh, it managed to do so by ignoring all the nuisance variability inside the class. For example, the important information, the fact that uh, this is the picture of a bird, uh, is usually entangled with a lot of nuisance information that we don't really care about. For example, the position of the bird uh, or uh, um, the particular type of the bird, uh, the color of the background, the point of view of the observer, and all these other uh, nuisance variability. And so the network somehow managed to learn an internal representation to this, um, that managed to abstract and be invariant for these properties. So this is kind of surprising because uh, we actually never asked the network to learn such a representation. What we do is just to take uh, a training set and find a set of ways that happen to perfectly minimize this dead set. So perfectly minimize the loss function over this step set. We never actually asked the network to find a good representation while doing so. And it's also more surprising because actually finding such a representation isn't a, a simple problem. And many, uh, a lot of people work very hard in uncrafting representation that have all these properties. Even so, a neural network just train on a simple data set without us asking anything can manage to find such a good representation. So the question I would like to start from and my key question during this talk is, well, where exactly does this pressure to learn a good representation comes from? Where in the training process and when during the training process does this kind of representation naturally emerge uh, as optimal uh, for a deep network to learn? So, as you may have guessed, uh, one of the main points uh, I will talk about uh, is information and information-related quantities. So maybe let's just start by uh, looking at some of the uh, quantities uh, I will need. Uh, I think you will probably be familiar with most of them, but it's just like a um, a good point to fix the notation for later. So first of all, there is the cross-entropy loss. So the cross-entropy loss is the loss which is commonly used in deep learning. It's just the expectation over the data distribution on minus logarithm of the model distribution. And that's a, a very important property that it's easy to compute and it's minimized exactly when the model distribution coincides with the data distribution. The reason why this is so is its relationship with the kullback libler divergence, which is a sort of an asymmetric distance between distributions. And it's uh, uh, what you've probably already seen in variational inference in other tutorials during the school. So the kullback libler divergence uh, is related to the cross-entropy loss, since uh, uh, the cross-entropy is just the entropy plus the kullback libler divergence. In particular, the cross-entropy is minimized exactly when the kullback libre divergence between the two distributions is zero. Finally, the main uh, quantity I care about is the mutual information between two random variables x and z. And so the mutual information is the uh, expected divergence between uh, the posterior of z after an observation of x and the prior of z. So it basically quantifies how much information an observation of X carries about Z. Okay, so cross-entropy loss, kullback libler divergence, mutual information. So these are the three main, proper, uh, three main quantities that we'll use during the talk. So uh, is there any doubt about the notation or should we go on? 
Okay. In any case, feel free to interrupt at any moment with any question. So now we have enough to consider the first uh, question in order to start the representations from information theoretic point of view, which is, um, let's say that I have a task Y, we could be, for example, the binary question, is there a dog in this picture? Then, of course, I can easily answer the question using the original uh, picture of a dog. But if you look at the second picture, uh, which is a much more compressed and smaller version of the original picture, it's still just fine in order to answer the question. But on the other end, it's something like 70 times smaller than the original picture. So this begs the question, OK, so how much information can I throw away from the original data while still be able to answer the, origin the task question? In other words, how much can I compress the input while maintaining my ability to solve the task? So this seems like a very important question in uh, information theory and also in deep learning. And it's also the question which is answered by the classical information bottleneck principle. In fact, uh, the main question of the uh, information bottleneck principle is exactly this. So, uh, more formally, given some data x and a task variable y, we want to find a representation d, which is maximally compressed, and but such that uh, it's uh, as good as the original uh, input x in order to solve the task d. So the problem with this minimization problem is that uh, it's not very easy to work with uh, 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 non-convex constraints uh, such this. Uh, uh, um, identity between the, uh, the cross entropy. So it's easier to switch to a, a weakened version of this problem by considering the corresponding Lagrangian. The corresponding Lagrangian is known as the information button Lagrangian after the work of Dishpin. And you can basically see this uh, as uh, trying to find a loss function, which is trying to find a good compromise before, uh, between. Uh, being able to solve the task perfectly and having a compressed representation of the input. So this still is just uh, halfway to the solution of the problem because uh, it's an easier minimization problem than the original one. It's still not obvious that we can do anything to minimize this efficiently. But before we actually look at the algorithm, let's just ask the question, okay, but so what exactly is the compressed representation of the input? Well, uh, there are basically two main ways in which you can think of about compression, and I will use both of these ways during the talk. One is we can reduce the dimension of the input. So for example, if I map multiple uh, access to the same z, then I'm kind of reducing the dimension of my representation d. And this is what is commonly happening when I use, for example, max pooling or when I do dimensionality reduction by, uh, for example, uh, going through a smaller layer in network or this kind of uh, architecture bottlenecks that I can introduce. Another way, however, to compress is to go in the complete opposite direction. I can increase the dimensionality of my input, but at the same time, I can inject noise in the map. So the map between X and D becomes stochastic. I'm not sure which D will correspond to which X. And by, uh, this stochasticity, this noise I'm introducing in the map, uh, actually uh, makes uh, uh, me lose information and the form makes me compress the representation D with respect to X. And this is what is commonly used, for example, uh, in default or batch normalization. These are all ways in which uh, I can introduce stochasticity in the, uh, in the map of a neural network and therefore uh, compress the representation learned by the network. You can also see now how this can be something useful in practice. So, for example, if I uh, reduce the dimension, then I have a sort of task-dependent clustering. For example, uh, let's say that my task doesn't really care about the specific breed of the dog or the specific uh, species of the bird. I only care about whether this is a feature of a dog or a bird. 
then I would like my representation to just cluster together all the images of a dog and all the images of a bird. And this is exactly what the information bot in Eclos uh, is going to try to do. It will try to find a map which uh, uh, maps together as much as possible, or in another sense, which clusters together as much as possible, while still maintain the clusters separate enough in order to be able to later use them to solve the task. Okay, so um, I hope this gives uh, more or less an idea of how I would like to use the information bottleneck, and we will see many, many uses of the information bottleneck later in the talk. Clustering is just one of the most basic uh, and first applications of the principle. But now let's think about, uh, okay, so how do I actually minimize the information bottleneck to find these clusters? Well, so the argument comes from uh, uh, realizing uh, a very important relationship between information bottleneck and rate distortion theory. So rate distortion theory is one of the uh, oldest uh, uh, topics to study in information theory and ask the question, if I need to compress my input uh, to some uh, level of compression R, what is the least distortion that I can obtain in reconstructing the input? For example, uh, let's say that I want to compress an image in five kilobytes. What is the lowest uh, uh, reconstruction error that I can obtain uh, using this level of compression? So, uh, as you may notice, uh, this is actually a very similar problem to the information bottleneck. And actually, it's perfectly equivalent uh, to the information bottleneck problem when we choose uh, as the uh, distortion metric T the quantity of information that Z retains about the task Y. And I should also notice that uh, the rate distortion is a very well-studied problem for a lot of random variables. And in this case, we can obtain a very explicit solution in closed form. And also, we can obtain the full rate distortion curve, which is uh, for each uh, uh, capacity, we can explicitly say what is the optimal distortion we can obtain for that capacity. So this curve, which is basically what separates the range of possible uh, compression algorithm for the range of the impossible compression algorithm so that it can just cannot exist, is called the rate distortion curve. And uh, it's, uh, uh, again, very well studied for a lot of problems. Uh, and uh, in general, it has a lot of theoretical properties. Uh, and in the specific case of the information bottleneck, it's also known as the information bottleneck curve, for obvious reasons. So, uh, so uh, I will not really use a lot of the properties of this curve later, but just uh, uh, nice to know that uh, they exist. What I will use is uh, just uh, one key algorithm in order to solve the uh, rate distortion problem, which is known as the Blauter remote algorithm. So what we're going to do, it's actually a very intuitive thing. So we're going to find both an encoder distribution, which goes from uh, the input X to encoding uh, the input to the representation Z. And then we're going to find a decoder distribution, which takes the representation Z and uses the representation in order to solve the task Y. So we're going to start from a, a random encoding distribution and and we will find the best possible decoding distribution associated to this encoder distribution. Then we fix the decoder, and we find the best possible encoder for this decoder, and we start iterating. Given an encoder, we find the best possible decoder, and vice versa. The rules for the updates are given by this uh, uh, free equation to the, um, to the left. And the key property to notice here that what we're doing is basically we have two convex sets, the one of all possible encoders and the one of all possible decoders, and we're just uh, iteratively projecting on one or the other of the two sets. Uh, and we iterate this until uh, uh, the algorithm converts to some solution, and we are guaranteed convergence of this algorithm precisely because both sets are convex, and so sooner or later this algorithm will converge well. So, 
this is the question. Okay, this is all fine. If I can actually explicitly write down the encoder distribution, the decoder distribution, which I can do when uh, x, z, and y are uh, uh, discrete random variables uh, with few states. In that case, I can write down the full probability uh, table, and I can optimize the probability table using this rule. However, in the more realistic case in which uh, uh, z is not discrete, it's a continuous variable, or in which uh, uh, z is discrete, uh, but it has exponentially many possible states, for example, in an image, we would have something of the order of uh, maybe uh, uh, two to the 1,000 or uh, 1 million of different images, discrete images, and uh, as can assume. And it's just much to just store everything in memory of the possible combination of states. So what we would like to do is to just have a parameterized encoder and a parameterized decoder and optimize this. On the other hand, if I use a parameterized encoder and decoder, I lose the convexity of the two sets. So I lose any guarantees about convergence. And I also lose the ability of explicitly using these three rules, since I will not be able to do the summation over all x's and the summation over all y's. So, and so this brings us to the uh, first part of the talk, which is uh, how we can solve the information button problem using deep learning, and more importantly, how this relates to representation learning in deep networks. So, so uh, before we go here, uh, is there any question or any doubt about the uh, classical version of the information button? Okay, so... Uh, Okay, so here we start from a slightly different point of view. The one of representation learning, which is also one of the, uh, another one of the oldest areas to study in machine learning. So as you will see, the uh, notation and the names are a little bit different, but the main concept stays the same. So in representation learning, given some data X, I'm going to find a representation z, which is the stochastic function of the input x, in order to solve a task y. And I define an optimal representation to be something which is, uh, so far, sufficient for the task, meaning that all the information that uh, uh, the input contains about y is also contained in the representation z. Then, I want to abstract of the i-dimensional raw sensory data and have uh, a compact representation Z of the input in order to solve the task, which uh, I call a minimality requirement for Z. Then I want my representation to be invariant to nuisances. So what does this mean? Well, if there is a random variable N, which is independent from the task Y, then I don't want this random variable to be encoded in the representation Z or to affect the representation Z in any way. For example, if I know that uh, uh, my task is independent from the value of the background pixel, so then I don't want the background pixel to be encoded in my representation or to change the representation in any way. So this means being invariant to nuisance. So finally, I also want the representation to have some kind of disentanglement properties, by which I mean that, for example, I would like one component of my representation to encode the position of the object, so one, uh, one other component to encode the shape, and a different component to encode the color. So all these semantically different aspects of the uh, task, I would like them to be encoded in separate components of the representation. Okay, so as you may have noticed, this is kind of similar to what we already talked about it with the information bottleneck. And in fact, if we just write down the sufficiency and minimality requirement, we still end up with exactly the same minimization problem of the information bottleneck. Therefore, again, we can introduce the same information bottleneck program to solve this. But in the particular case of representation learning in deep networks, the information bottleneck program actually is a much 
actually it's uh, a very surprising function to see because if you look at it, but the first term of the information button Lagrange it has the cross entropy loss, which is already commonly used to train deep networks. So to this cross entropy loss, however, we are adding a new term in the information button Lagrange, which is some kind of regularizer, which is trying to limit the flow of information through the network. So this is actually very good news because it means that if we can just fix a neural network in order to use the new regularizer, we will have a device which is able to minimize the information button in Lagrangian using a deep network. And so now we would be able to use the full efficiency and power of training a deep network. But before we go in this direction, this only takes care of minimality and sufficiency. I also had other requirements. In particular, I had a requirement of invariance of the representation. So what about it? How do we train a neural network in order to to learn an invariant representation of the data. Well, as it turns out, we don't actually need to do that because invariance is actually uh, equivalent to minimality. To be more precise, if Z is a sufficient representation of the data for the task and then it's a nuisance, then the degree of invariance of the representation to the nuisance it's upper bounded only by the minimality of the representation. Uh, moreover, there always exists a nuisance n for which equality holds, meaning that uh, the representation is maximally invariant uh, to all nuisances at the same time, if and only if it is a minimal representation of the input, which is a great news because it means that uh, if we can just minimize the information button click tangent, then we automatically learn a uh, uh, invariant representation. And more importantly, it means that we already have some tools to, uh, to enforce invariance of a representation in deep learning. Because if you think about it, the only thing that I need is to compress my, uh, inform uh, my representation in order to make it more minimal. But we've already seen that there are quite a few ways of compressing a representation. First of all, I can reduce the dimension using max pooling or by using a smaller layer. Or I can add noise during the training uh, using, for example, dropout or batch normalization. So these are all ways in which I just, by architecture, make um, my representation smaller or more compressed in an information theoretic way. So always remember the representation can be larger the only thing that matters is that the information content of the representation is smaller. Um, and so, once I, can, I do this for one layer, I can just start iterating this procedure layer by layer, and the representation will become smaller and smaller. And in doing so, the nuisance information is basically thrown out of the representation because it's not needed. And the spare capacity is only used to encode the task relevant information. So at the end, we will have a representation with only encode task relevant information and it's invariant to all nuisance information. And this just by adding a little bit of noise in the network or by just reducing the dimension of the layer. So, so it's a very easy way of just gaining invariance by architecture. However, it's not really optimal because it requires us to um, to end the sign the optimal dropout rate or end the sign the optimal size of a layer in order to get just the right size for the representation to store all the important information while uh, being too small to learn new to encode nuisance information. So what we would like here it's just to have a flexible bottleneck that we can automatically tune in order to reach the optimal size of the representation. That is, we would like to actually solve the information bottleneck. And the way we can do this is to uh, add noise to the network. For example, we can add multiple team noise from a Gaussian distribution, and we can have the variance of noise to be a function of the input, which is learned by the network. 
So now the network can, so this noise is going to create an information bottleneck inside the network. And the size of this information bottleneck is governed, is decided by the variance of the multiplicative noise we are adding. And now we can use the information bottleneck loss to actually optimize and find the optimal variance of the noise to add. Doing this, we end up with uh, this regularized loss function for a deep network. And now we finally have an algorithm which is able to find the optimal bottleneck that minimizes the information bottleneck Lagrangians and gives us the best representation, which is invariant to all different sets. And we can actually also visualize what this does in practice. So, so in this experiment, what I'm doing is I train a network to classify uh, this digit in the middle of clutter. And uh, uh, so what I show here is for each dropout layer of the network, how much information about the input is being transmitted to the next layer. So what you can see happening is that each dropout layer learns to drop more and more irrelevant nuisance information about the cluster. And, and, the, and the last layer, only information about uh, the task is kept in the representation and uh, everything else is thrown away. So now the representation is invariant to all this cluster nuisance. If now I change the parameter of beta controlling uh, how, uh, in, in the information bottleneck, I'm going to change how aggressive the network is in throwing away nuisance variability. So as you can see, for beta close to zero, the network still retains a lot of information about uh, the uh, uh, the nuisances, and for a higher value of uh, uh, beta, everything is harshly thrown away immediately. And so, you may notice uh, um, that this is actually also kind of similar to variation out in person. So, for uh, those that don't know, if uh, variation out encoders are just a standard out encoder, which, given an input x, uh, encodes it in some, in some uh, representation t, and then uh, tries to reconstruct the original input from the representation t. Uh, the main difference is that in variation out encoder, I'm going to add noise to the intermediate representation t. And I'm going to optimize both of the noise and the representation using the variational lower bound, which is given by this loss function. Or more recently, it has been proposed to actually minimize this modified variational lower bound with a general parameter beta in front of the KL divergence term. So this is kind of similar to what we are doing. And you may notice that this loss function actually is kind of similar to the information bottling plot. In particular, it's exactly the same as the information bottleneck loss function. The only difference is that uh, here in the KL divergence term, we are using the fixed factorized prior P of C instead of using the real uh, marginal distribution Q of C. If we had used the marginal distribution, this would just be the mutual information, and this will reduce to uh, the uh, information bottleneck loss. So the natural question here is that, okay, so what does it change when I use a fixed factorized prior rather than the real marginal? And the answer is actually quite uh, elegant. And uh, so minimizing this modified loss function with the fixed prior is the same as minimizing the original information bottleneck plus a new total correlation term. So what does this total correlation term do? It's trying to minimize the correlation between the components of the representation, meaning that if I modify the uh, loss function of a variation out encoder, what I'm going to do is to still minimize the information bottom loss function, but I'm also going to minimize the uh, entanglement between all the components of the representation. So I'm going to find a representation which is both minimal and therefore invariant, and also disentangled. And this has been shown very nice, uh, very nicely by work of DeepMind. So 
Here, uh, um, what I'm showing is uh, uh, I'm uh, uh, training. Uh, uh, so uh, this is from uh, deployment paper, and uh, so what they did is to uh, train a variation art encoder and then change one single component of the representation and see how this affects the uh, the reproduce uh, image. So what you can see is that. Uh, there is one component, and if I change this component, then the position of the object is going to change. If I change another component, the uh, size of the object or the shape of the object or the color of the object are going to change. And so this is quite remarkable, because it means that by just looking at the picture, the variation out encoder learn that there are these factors of variation, and learn to encode all these factors of variation in separate components of the representation. And uh, there's some more surprising that uh, the loss function, this is minimizing, uh, actually only asks for something very simple. It asks for, uh, um, uh, it asks to have uncorrelated uh, components. But this is doing something which looks uh, much stronger than that. It's, trying, it's basically finding uh, components uh, which by themselves uh, have a very semantic meaning. Uh, so, uh, so a little bit of an echo. Is there any problem with the audio? Uh, uh, yeah, so there is a lot of noise in the background. Can you hear me the fine? If yes, I can continue. Mm. Uh, is there any problem with the audio? Yeah. Um, I'm going to assume everything is fine uh, then. Uh, okay. Can you wave at me if you can uh, hear me just fine? Hello? Um, uh, can you hear me? Anyone in? Okay, sure, perfect. Uh, okay, then uh, let's go back. Um, okay, so, okay, so apparently this is something more than just finding an uncorrelated representation. This is finding something with a semantical meaning. And how far can we bring this concept of finding a semantic meaning for representation using uh, this trick of uh, uh, compressing the representation? So in this other work, uh, joined with DeepMind, we try to train a variation of encoder on several different domains. And uh, what we did was to first take one feature in one domain, encode it using the variation out encoder, and then we decoded this feature using the decoder of a separate domain. Uh, and what you could, so what we obtain in this way is kind of a domain to domain translation, so cross domain translation. So what you can see is that when we do this, uh, the, um, the version of the encoder learns to translate the image in a way which is uh, uh, semantically meaningful. For example, in the original picture, it's from a natural landscape. Uh, in this case, there is a geometry of the landscape given, for example, by uh, how far the origin is and this kind of uh, uh, variability. In the, in the second domain, we are inside a closed room, and so the geometry is given by the walls of the room. What this variation of the encoder is learned to do is to map the variability of the first domain, so the geometry of the uh, landscape, to the geometry of the room. So it replaces the horizon with the walls of the room in a meaningful way. Also, there is variability in the original domain represented by the presence of these uh, uh, trees. And there is a, a similar variability in uh, uh, the indoor domain represented by the presence of these red objects. 
And so the British Islands and Cobra began to map the trees to the uh, objects because uh, it makes semantical sense to do so. So this again is not something which is really written in just uh, the, the top correlation requirement. It's actually something quite surprising that emerged naturally when training a deep neural network in order to find a compressed representation of the input. And I believe it's also one very interesting field of study. But so, uh, I think I will skip this part. And, okay, so now just to summarize what we've seen until now. We have talked a little bit about the presentation learning, and in particular, having a minimal sufficient invariant representation is the key thing we want to do in representation learning. And we discovered that it's actually not so difficult to do that by uh, using uh, learning, because uh, by using some uh, information theoretic identities, we're seen that finding a, a minimal Oh, sorry, an invariant representation is actually the same as just reducing the dimensionality of the representation or even better, adding noise to the activation of the network. And in doing so, we also gain some form of semantic disentanglement of the learned representation. So, but this is still not quite yet where we want to be because this is only looking at, okay, if I take the network and if I encraft uh, a new loss function for the network, or if I change the architecture of this network, then I can learn a representation of, net, uh, a representation of the data which has all these properties. Uh, but this is not what we usually do in practice. Uh, usually in practice, we just, uh, again, start from a training set, find some weights uh, which happens to perfectly classify all images in the data set, and then we're done. So, we what I want to do now is to try to understand which part of this process of finding the optimal weights leads to the network automatically learning a good representation even without me forcing the network to do so. And this would bring us to the second part of the talk. But before that, is there any question about about Hmm? Alessandra, I think uh, the questions will be so, at the end of your lecture. Well, sorry, I can see. Okay, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, okay, so. What about the weight? So, well, so, okay, so let's look at what we actually do in practice. So what we do in practice is to take a loss function, which is just the cross entropy without any regularizer, and we're going to minimize the cross entropy loss on some, uh, on some data set, which actually looks like a terrible idea to do. Because uh, as we know from the bias variance speed off, if I have a very complex model and I just minimize the cross entropy loss without any regularization, I will widely overfit to the data. However, it does not look to be the case for deep networks. For deep networks, the more I increase the dimension of the network, the more layers I add, the better the network becomes. It doesn't seem like the complexity of the network really plays a role in overfitting. Now, to see why this should happen, Let's look at the cross entropy loss function which we are minimizing and let's start to the composite to get some more insight about it. So, the cross entropy loss can be decomposed in a few terms which are positive terms and are indeed very good to minimize. However, there is an extra negative term which is basically the amount of information that the network is memorizing about the set. The problem is that the network can always uh, uh, bring uh, the cross entropy loss to zero by just memorizing more and more information without actually trying to understand the underlying that distribution, which will be given by the other two terms. So we can easily prevent this gain from the network by just adding back to the cross entropy loss this uh, overfitting term in order to simplify it. And so we get this. Uh, 
um, the function, which however is still very complex to minimize because it's very complex to uh, compute uh, this term that we're adding. However, what we can do is to upper bound this term by just using the quantity of information contained in the weight of the network. By doing so, we end up with this modified loss function, which actually looks like uh, looks very similar to the information button loss. And in fact, this is an information bottleneck. However, before we have seen an information bottleneck for the activations of the network, this is, a, is instead an information bottleneck for the weight of the network. And the way you can picture this is that in order for the network to generalize well at testing time, we need to put a bottleneck between the training of the network and the testing of the network. And this bottleneck is given exactly by the weight of the network, by how much information about the training data we are storing in the weight and we are going to use the test time. So, in other words, in representation learning, we wanted the activations of the network to be a minimum efficient statistic of the input. On the other end, in, uh, in uh, uh, training a deep network, we want the weights instead to be a minimum efficient statistic of the world training data for the task of future inference. So, okay. Uh, but still, what is actually the quantity of information in the weight and how we minimize it or do anything with it? So, the quantity of information in the weight is actually pretty easy to uh, upper bound. And we can, in fact, upper bound it as the care divergence between the posterior of the weight distribution and a, prior P, a fixed prior P on the weight. On the weight. So, which is something you've already seen because when we rewrite the loss function in the single bound, you obtain something which uh, looks really similar to well, just the variation of lower bound in order to learn uh, to do variation inference on the weights of the network. In fact, if I put the value of beta equal to one in this expression, I will exactly obtain the variation of lower bound. So you can think of the information button Lagrangian for the weights. It's kind of a generalization of the standard variational lower bound. And more importantly, this means that now I can reuse all the standard techniques in uh, variational inference in order to optimize the quantity of information in the weights and therefore in order to minimize the information button for the weights. So in particular, variational dropout, which I think you've seen in previous talks. Uh, during the school, uh, still applies uh, to uh, minimize this new loss function. Okay, so when I, I introduced everything, I said, okay, we want to use the information button for the weight in order to uh, minimize the overfitting of the network. Is there any way in which we can formalize the concept? And the answer is yes. We can use the path based bound to justify this. To be more precise, uh, the fact based bound after bounds the set, the future test error of the network based on exactly the value of the information bottling flagrant for the weight. Meaning that uh, you can think of this as uh, the imagine information bottling flagrant for the weight doesn't just uh, minimize the error of the network on the training test. But what it's doing is actually trying to minimize the number bound on the future test error of the network. And this certifies uh, theoretically why we believe that the information of uh, the for the weights uh, minimizes overfitting and also gives a different way of uh, uh, producing uh, this particular function. So, uh, and it's also interesting to note that actually this gives an upper bound on the test error. Usually this upper bound is unfortunately vacuous in the sense that uh, it just says that the test error will be less than one, which is not However, there has been progress recently in uh, 
your deep learning to find a bound on the set error of the network, which is on the it's still uh, not uh, incredibly sharp, but uh, we are getting much better at bounding the best performance in, in this way. Okay, so we can actually now test this and we get the expected behavior. So if I change the value of the regularizer, I change the amount of the error of the network. Not precise, we actually recover some form of the bias rate with us. So in the end, this is really stand to us is that uh, the, the real complexity of the model is not so much the size of the model, meaning number of layers or the number of weights inside the model. But really, we should think of as the size of the model is the quantity of information storing the weights independently on how many weights there actually are in the network. So if we are parameterized the final performance of the network as a function of the information in the weights, we actually recover the right train, uh, the right uh, uh, trend of the bias variance of whereas if we have very little information inside the weights, then uh, of course, the network cannot classify correctly. If we put too much information in the way in the network, we start with repeating. And the optimal trade off is an in between value for the information in the way. But also, there is uh, another uh, theoretically uh, interesting aspect that we can recover from this construction. So, as we discussed before, for the particular value of bit equal to 1, we recover exactly the variation over the bound. But the critical value of bit equal to 1 actually has uh, uh, another interesting theoretical property. So, if the set set consists entirely of random levels, then at bit equal to 1, we predict a uh, uh, a phase transition between uh, perfectly overfitting all the labels when beta is less than 1 and completely underfitting all the labels when beta is greater than 1. And this is something that we can actually test in practice. So in the plot to the left, each point of the plot is a neural network trained on a different size of the deficit with a different uh, value of the regularizer. You can see that for random labels, uh, there is a sharp space distinction between overfitting the random levels for beta less than 1 and underfitting the random levels for beta less than 1. And you can see the same trend in the plot to the right. So for different uh, architectures, uh, near beta equal to 1, we observe this uh, sharp space distinction between the two. Now, for real levels, you said, the story is very different. For real levels, uh, there is some sort of Goldilocks zone for, value, uh, for values of beta more than one, where I can fit the data without overfitting and without underfitting. So there is this area where I can fit just right. And this is generally the area where we want to be during training, the area. Uh, they are far away from this experience. It's also that, that we should always try to use a value of beta which is one or more than one uh, during training. Which also agree to the variation over bound, which will do it exactly with that to one, which is value. Okay, so until now we have uh, uh, introduced a lot of different concepts here, which we can mainly group in uh, uh, three different areas. We have talked about information in the regression. We have seen that if we minimize the information in the regression, we will end up with our representation, which is invariant to nuisance. We have talked about information in the weights. And we have seen that minimizing information in the weights gives us a uh, representation, uh, gives us a um, better generalization performance for the network. And we yet have to talk about, of course, we will have to talk about optimization. So how do we actually 
end up with this value of the Y. So now in this part of the talk, what I want to do is try to connect all these different things that we have talked about. So how is the information activation or invariance connected to uh, information in the weight uh, of generalization? And now it's everything connected to optimization. So let's start with the first connection, the one between uh, activation and weights. So uh, this connection is actually not so difficult to see using the framework, the classical framework we have So you have probably got the idea, uh, both from this talk or previous talks, uh, uh, there is this thing that uh, uh, compressing the weights or minimizing the quantity of information in the weights uh, is the same as basically adding noise to the weights, uh, which is exactly what, for example, by national But then uh, let's look at the architecture of the network. If I add noise to the weight of the network, then I'm also going to add noise to the activations of the network because it's just a simple discussion between weights and input in order to get the final activations. But then, if I'm going to add noise to the activations, it means that I'm going to compress the activations of the network. And we can actually formalize this. Uh, uh, this intuition, and we have that uh, for one single layer, the quantity of information in the activation plus the total correlation of the activation is upper bounded by the quantity of information in the weight of the layer, which is uh, uh, very nice because now we can connect to things that apparently were completely separated. Because now it says that if I just try to compress the weight of the network by whatever means, by variation of the path, by composing the weight or whatever else, I will automatically learn a representation which is more compressed, meaning that it's invariant to mutant sets and mutant sets. And so, just to summarize, we have the missing link that we wanted between the training procedure, so how we go from uh, the training that to the, uh, to the network we see at this time, and the properties uh, that we observe at this time, so the invariance of the layer of the mutant variability. And this thing uh, is being caused by the fact that uh, if we compress the weight during training, uh, automatically the invariance properties of the layers will emerge uh, as a consequence of this uh, information threat bound uh, duality between uh, information in the web and information in the situation. So, and this is also something that we can measure in practice. So in this experiment, uh, I'm trying to classify an emit digit uh, and there is some degree of uh, occlusion uh, and what you can see is that by changing the value of the regularizer data, so by changing the amount of information in the weight of the network, uh, it changes the amount of invariance of the learned representation to the mutant uh, variable. So by just compressing the weight, we automatically have the emergence of the invariance inside the layers of the network. Okay, so this is also uh, one problem that we have. Still, it's not the complete answer to everything because, uh, yes, if I compress the weight of the network uh, by explicitly adding noise, using variation of the thought or whatever other mean, then uh, I will get all these nice properties in the activation talk. But we don't always do this in the planning. In the planning, we can very easily just minimize the problem philosophy. I still am back to the practical representation not done by the network. So, where is this compression? Where does the compression in the way come from when uh, we are not explicitly uh, putting it into the loss function? So, the popular theory right now is that all this sort of compression really comes from the optimization procedure and, and more precisely, so we think it has things that stochastically understand 
is going to add some, um, some degree of compression. And there are two different ways in which we can uh, uh, attack the problem. So I believe uh, in this same school, Bastille, uh, THP uh, proposed a view of the problem, which is a link between uh, uh, stochastic gradient descent and the quantity of the machine deprivation. So, so I uh, really encourage everyone to uh, look at the YouTube video of the talk. Uh, I will just uh, uh, summarize the main points that we will display in the talk. So uh, what this we observe is that uh, uh, during training, there is a first phase in which the network tries to put more and more information inside the activation of the network. And then there is a second phase of the training where the network tries to compress the activation more and more. Uh, however, it's also worth to notice that uh, uh, precisely how to uh, measure the quantity of information and how to interpret the results of the science of the particular architecture of the network and the way you estimate the, uh, the probability density. So uh, this again is not something I will go in detail here. Uh, I just wanted to remark uh, uh, the observation of the two phases uh, in the activation. And instead, now I will uh, uh, look at the problem for a, a complete orthogonal point of view, which is that of uh, the relationship between stochastic gradient descent and the quantity of information to the weight of the system. So now, uh, uh, let's consider the problem. What does the information in the weight look like during training? Well, a sensible um, Guess uh, would be that we start with the information in the weights at the beginning of the training. And the more we go forward during the training, the more information we learn to encode in the weights that are useful. And, and then we encode more and more information until we reach some asymptotic value of the information in the weights. At that point, we are satisfied and we don't learn anything else from this system. So, okay, this is a uh, uh, sensible uh, uh, claim, and it's something that we can actually uh, measure in practice. So, how do we do this? Uh, it will be useful to introduce the following approximation. So, we have um, we before that the quantity of information in the weight is basically the L emergence between the procedure of the weight that are observing the data set and the prior of the weight. So, use a very simple uh, uh, normal procedure and normal prior for the weights, uh, you can show that to the second order approximation, the quantity of information in the weights is given by the edge norm of the weights plus the log determinant of the fish information matrix. Now, there are two things you need to know about fish information matrix, which will be useful. One is that the fish information matrix, or at least the diagonal of the fish information matrix, is very easy to compute starting from the gradient of the network. And then, if that the fish information matrix is equal to the action of the loss function in a local minimum, which also gives us this interesting parallel, that is that a uh, uh, minimum always have a low amount of information. Because, again, flat minimum means that the action is very, is close to zero for in that location. But since the minimum dash is equal to the efficient information matrix, and having a low efficient information matrix means that uh, the quantity of information will be will be smaller. Now, we have this uh, uh, a nice approximation for the information in the weight. And uh, we can just look at how it changes during the training of the network. And the result is actually not what we were expecting at all. So there is a first phase in which actually, yes, the quantity of information in the weight increases. So we learn more and more about the data by looking at the data set and we encode all this information in the way. 
However, after that, and at least the training, there is a separate phase in which the network very rapidly starts to forget information and ends up to a low asymptotic value of the information. We will also correspond to the network converging to a very fast uh, minimum. So it's kind of surprising that the network is not just happy with what it learned until some point. At some point, the network actively tries to forget what it learned, but in the same time, the performance of the network on the training data keeps up, uh, on the training and on the testing data keeps improving. So in the green dashed line there is the performance of the testing. So you can see that uh, the network starts to forget, but at the same time, the performance of the network actually increases. So this is kind of remarkable, and uh, we would like to understand a little bit better uh, what testing is. So to do so, I will uh, borrow some techniques from uh, neuroscience. So in neuroscience, one very useful technique to watch the early development of the brain is to look at critical periods. So, so what are critical periods? A critical period is uh, a phase, a time period in the early development where a temporary sensory test can permanently impair the opportunity. For example, if a, a person is born with a cataract in one eye, if the cataract is corrected soon enough, then the person learns to use, to use the eye without any problem. However, if the cataract is not correct soon enough during the development, then the person will never actually learn to use the eye, even if the cataract is later corrected. It's kind of surprising because now there's a person with a perfectly working eye, but still uh, the brain cannot use this eye. And the reason is that uh, the brain needs to learn how to use the sensor information during a restricted time period. If the sensor information is not present during this restricted time period, the brain will not, will never learn how to use this information. So, the use of critical period uh, to study uh, development of the brain has been championed by Google and Diesel, which work extensively on kittens, uh, and in particular on monocular deprivation of kittens, which has the same effect of cataracts, uh, but uh, uh, it's uh, uh, easier to reproduce experimentally. And so what you can observe is that uh, if you uh, uh, include the eye of kitten for, uh, uh, let's say, 100 or 200 days after birth, then the kittens never actually learn to use, properly use the eye, as you can see from the blue curve in the plot, which is the increase of uh, visual acuity uh, based on when the deficit is removed. Okay, so we can plan a similar experiment for deep networks and supercomputers. In particular, what I can do is to uh, show the network some set of blurred images early during the training to simulate a cataract deficit uh, to the network. Then, after some point, I remove this deficit and I just train the network using normal resolution images. So what you can observe is that surprisingly, the convolutional network is, is a critical period in order to learn to properly process the input, which is very similar to the one we will observe in kittens for monocular deprivation. So this means that if I don't show the network, the real picture soon enough during the training, the network will never actually learn to process full resolution images, no matter how much additional training I perform. It is kind of surprising because uh, there are many reasons why uh, the brain could have a critical period. Uh, there are uh, challenges in the chemistry inside the brain uh, as, uh, uh, as uh, the brain matures, which could lead to uh, critical periods. 
However, for convolutional networks, there is no real change. Uh, I mean, the training procedure is always the same. The plasticity of the waves uh, is always the same. And moreover, you can actually measure something more uh, uh, fine, which is the sensitivity of uh, 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 the training uh, the training phase to the learning uh, to uh, to deficit. So, so in order to do this, we introduce a deficit just for a short time window during the training. And we observe that even just a short temporary deficit during uh, some point in early training is enough to let a permanent damage in the performance of the network. Moreover, what we observe is that if we introduce a deficit just uh, near the end of the training, the network really got the error, like nothing at all is affected. However, if I introduce the deficit uh, sometimes around uh, top 40 of the training for this particular network, then I observe uh, a consistent decrease in the appearance of the network, which is also similar to what we will observe in the same experiment uh, in any network. So, apparently, the early phase of stochastic game descent, the function phase of stochastic game descent, is actually doing something very complicated, which results in uh, this kind of critical period. And we may ask the question, okay, so is this also related to this weird behavior of the information in the way? The An answer is yes, absolutely. So what you can see is that uh, the sensitivity of the network to deficit peaks uh, exactly at the same time in which uh, the quantity of information in the way peaks. That is, uh, the network is uh, sensitive to this exactly during the moment in which it's trying to absorb as much information as possible from the training sector. While on the other end, once the network is done absorbing information and is in this consolidation phase of the information that it already has, then it's not very sensitive to any deficit because all the information that it needs is basically already encoded in the way. So changing the training set doesn't change how the information is already there. And okay, so but exactly why does this particular period happen? Why can the lack just when I introduce new information in the data set, we learn to use this new information. Well, I should point out that, that importantly, not all deficits, uh, visual deficits, are uh, come to the critical period. For example, vertical flipping of an image does not have an associated critical period. This is also the case for humans. So if you uh, use uh, um, uh, prismatic glasses with a mirror, which flips your vision field, uh, like the glasses in the picture here. Uh, what you will observe is that uh, uh, you will be very sick for about two weeks. But after that, the brain completely adapts to use the flip vision, and you don't observe any uh, particular problem in the person. Uh, uh, the test subject is going to be able to perform uh, exactly like before, uh, even with a completely inverted uh, visual field. And the same happens in a normal network. So, uh, uh, if I just uh, uh, flip the images, the network learns to classify flipped images very fastly and without any particular And the same if I permute the output level, so the network learns to use the new mapping of the output level without any problem. So, this is the key difference that makes vertical people not have a critical field, while image blur does have a critical field. And the answer is that blur, unlike vertical people, completely changes the way information structure inside the neural network. More precise. If I blur the images, then this means that uh, there is basically no information to process in the low layers. So, so the network basically uh, shifts all the attention to the last layers, so, 
which are able to protect the global features of the images, which are the only ones that are still there once a blur uh, Now, the problem is that uh, if I now remove the desktop and I show the original feature to the network, the network will need to reorganize its layer and start processing a lot of information in the intermediate layer because there is where the most information is most obtained. There are details in the original picture which can be processed by the intermediate layer. So now I need to put a lot of information in the way of the intermediate layer in order to process the text information. However, the network after some time gets lost in this long way configuration in which only the last layers are relevant and we cannot manage to learn new things in this intermediate layer. On the other hand, for a uh, vision system, what is important is that uh, uh, all the information we need is already there. We don't need to shift focus from one layer to the other. We arrange the internal configuration of the network. So the network just adapts to time. And so this is something uh, to, to that, that actually what is going to be doing with the very effect is to look at the structure of the data and uh, uh, decide what is the optimal structure for the weight of the network in order to process this. And this is done very early. And everything else is just filling uh, up the details. But what's really important is learning how to best process information in the data by adjusting the right quantity of information in the weight for each layer. So, there are uh, more things that we could discuss here because it's a very broad topic and it's especially interesting to understand how uh, par the parallel between a neural network and uh, uh, and uh, uh, animal uh, uh, can uh, 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 out close neural networks and animal parallel when we look at it from the point of view of that information. But so since uh, it's about time, I guess uh, I will rather stop here and just uh, try to summarize what we've seen now. So yeah, we've seen quite a few things. So, so one is uh, uh, the importance of information in the and the importance of information in the world. We've seen that Compressing that expression naturally leads to the important concept of invariance and disentanglement of the learner representation. While compression of the weight naturally leads to a question about the generalization performance of the network. So these two uh, kinds of information are apparently uh, different, but they're actually connected by a very powerful duality in the specific case of deep networks, so this is not a general default. But for deep networks, we have a duality between information in the white and information expression, which also says that compressing the weights implies that we are also going to compress the activation. So, therefore, invariant properties of the representation of the network can naturally enlarge the many by not compressing the weights. So, so. Now, uh, compression can happen very easily if we explicitly add noise to uh, a network in the form of the path, variation of the path, information of the path, or whatever else uh, form of noise. Which is compression. But also, compression seems to happen implicitly during the optimization process. In particular, we think that the way stochastic in the sense as uh, uh, these two phases, similar to the two phases of serving cells for ductive actions, basically, in which uh, uh, the network of course uh, learns to encode a lot of information and then starts to forget information. And actually, this forgetting of information is to a better generalization uh, from the network. And we've seen that a lot of what the final network and the final behavior of the network will look like depend specifically on this very initial transient phase of the behind the center, 
were more or less the wall internal architecture of the network seems to be decided and it comes in the development. So this is a conclusion and uh, uh, something that is very interesting to describe more accurately. And also it's uh, uh, very interesting to decide whether or not uh, there is an explicit uh, uh, parallel we can make between uh, uh, the initial phase of uh, neural net of training of neural network and the early development of brain in animals, at least from a very high level of information point of view. Okay, uh, so with this said, I think I can conclude now. Thank you very much for listening, and I will be more than happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Alessandro, for this lecture. Uh, if there are any questions, please ask them. Uh, hi, thank you for your talk. Uh, so, uh, you mentioned that there are basically two main approaches to compress uh, information. Uh, one is to reduce the dimensionality, and another yeah. is to add some kind of noise to weights activations. Uh, so, my question is uh, whether you can uh, combine these two approaches in some meaningful way, or you should choose just one and stick with it. Right, so, yeah, good question. So, uh, let's go back to uh, the slide. So, yeah, so uh, I think I've been a little bit misleading in uh, talking about this. So, uh, in practice, uh, you never, you shouldn't expect to have either one or the other. I mean, uh, both of them uh, happen. Uh, I think it's conceptually useful to think of these two different extremes. The one where uh, the dimension reduces and the one where the uh, dimension increases, but we increase the amount of noise at the same time uh, because it, it's useful to understand the specifics of uh, how different techniques in your networks work. For example, uh, dropout uh, is closer to increasing the size of while uh, injecting noise, uh, and uh, uh, max pooling is closer to just reducing the dimension. Of course, there is no um, we don't need to exclude between the two. So, for example, uh, in a standard VG network, uh, I have both of them at the same time. I have a fully connected layer uh, which reduces the dimension uh, of the input to 4000, uh, and then uh, I have also the fault applied to this. So, it's uh, uh, double the compression coming from the algorithm at the same time. Uh, one thing that I should notice, of course, is that uh, reducing the dimension when done explicitly through some singular mapping, uh, like max pooling, is something that uh, is written in the architecture once and once and so for all. And uh, so it's more difficult to optimize. The version where we just inject noise in order to do the optimization is much uh, more amenable to optimization, and it's what we can explicitly optimize using the progression button to the graph. All right, thank you.